Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to be here for this installment of our Feminism in Theory and Practice series today with a really, I think, um, indispensable pair of thinkers, Regina Mahone and Renee Bracey Sherman. Uh, they are the authors of Liberating Abortion, Our Legacy, Stories, and Visions for How We Save Us, which is forthcoming this fall from Amistad Harper Collins. And they are also the co-hosts of the podcast, The A-Files, A Secret History of Abortion, which I have really been loving. I hope you guys all uh, tune into that because what I have gotten from the podcast and what I've gotten a lot from uh, Renee and Regina's work more broadly is a really different perspective on abortion access and abortion rights than what we might ordinarily see in a lot of mainstream uh, reproductive rights discourses. They're adding a really essential history and context and new perspective that centers particularly the voices of those who have had abortions and centers their experiences and the way that we think about this issue. So I'm going to give their formal uh, bios because I could just sit here and sing their praises all day. Uh, Renee Bracey Sherman is the founder and executive director of We Testify, which is an organization that is dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions. And Regina Mahone is a senior editor of The Nation, who has covered a lot of abortion and reproductive rights issues for many years now. And they are here today to discuss their forthcoming book, Liberating Abortion. Thank you two so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Having us. I'm very excited. And congrats to you on, on this fellowship and all that you're curating with us. I'm really excited. It's been wonderful. I'm very lucky. And I'm really lucky to have you guys. I'm so excited about this book. So tell us a little bit about Liberating Abortion. What is your book and why did you want to write it? Sure, I can I can start, but I'll just, because we went through like... <laughs> For folks who've written books before, you go through like 14 different versions of your subtitle. So I'll just, it's liberating abortion, claiming our history, sharing our stories, and building the reproductive future that we deserve. Um, and we're so excited about it and so excited to talk about it today with you all. Um, so for me, what really um, brought me to this book and to this project is my abortion. Um, because when I had that abortion, I realized that I wanted to become a mom. Uh, and to say that it was confusing at that moment um, is putting it lightly. I didn't really understand all the feelings that I was having at the time. And we talk about this on our podcast too, the, the A-Files, The Secret History of Abortion. Um, but I didn't have any doubts at all about my decision. Um, I was just navigating all these thoughts and ideas around what it would mean to become a parent, what would happen um, if I had to do it on my own, if things didn't work out with me and my partner. And so many of those thoughts were really based on these negative images that I had been taught to believe about Black women, that we were these like, quote, welfare queens trying to live off of taxpayer dollars as if we didn't contribute to the economy or Black and black brown people don't, don't contribute generally or pay taxes. Um, and it's really wild to think back on that time um, because I was 29. I had a decent job, a salary. I was, I had my own apartment, all the things you're supposed to have, right? When you decide to have children, like a job, apartment, all these things that society tells us we need, even though that's not the case at all for a lot of people. Um, but still, I felt like it wasn't enough to parent without feeling like I would have to struggle. Um, and so I do, when I think about that time and we write about it in the book, I get really sad because I know so many other Black women and people of color feel that way. And it's not because of anything we did or because of who we actually are. It's because of what Black queer feminist scholar Maya Bailey described as mis misogynoir which is this level of discrimination that uniquely faces Black women by nature of us being Black and dealing with anti-Blackness and being women and dealing with misogyny in our society. And so after my abortion, I actually had the pleasure of getting to know Renee through her work at Rewire. At the time, um, I served there as managing editor. And we, when we finally became friends and started sharing with one another our different abortion experiences, we learned how we both shared this loneliness that wasn't really unique at all because it was shared between us, but it's because of the way that the media shapes narratives about who has abortions in this country, what are the circumstances that contribute to people having these abortions. We talked about the billboards that came out at the time that say the most dangerous place for uh, you know, a Black infant is in the womb. So all of these ideas around who we are as Black women, when we choose to parent or not parent, um, can really color our experiences. But Renee and I knew there were more people like us whose stories 
haven't been elevated or amplified like the stories of white women often are in the media um, who we really wanted to shine a light on. So for this book project, we really just wanted to find out like who are these people who are being ignored, who haven't been talked about enough. Um, and so for me, a lot of the book was really putting these threads together around my experience of having an abortion, but wanting to become a mom. Um, and this idea, you know, we talked about the book, like we're damned if we do have children. We're also damned if we choose to have an abortion. Um, and the choices we make as black women are so much undermined by the systemic oppression that we see over and over again. So a lot of what we're doing in the book is like unpacking those connections um, and really also setting a vision that's rooted in reproductive justice and the frameworks that have come before us around how we as people of color, but really everyone should have the ability to choose when to have a child, to choose when to choose to have their abortions and also to have access to bodily autonomy as we deserve um, in society. And so again, just a lot of the book was putting all of those things together. And I'm so grateful that we are getting so close to being being done with it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the folks in the audience have read a lot of books on abortion. Um, or, I mean, I'm sure all of you have seen photos of when they're like the before times, before Roe, the, what that looks like, what those marches looked like. And I'm pretty sure if you're thinking about a photo of a rally or something like that, all the people in it are white. That is just what happens in the way that we talk about abortion's history that it is this narrative of something that white women fought for. Um, and I remember both when I had my abortion um, and also when I started doing this work, seeing photos like that, feeling really alone. When I had my abortion at 19, I, I the only person, celebs that I, people that I knew who had an abortion, I had a cousin who was white, um, she had abortion and I knew with the rapper Lil' Kim. That was it. Everything else I'd heard of people talking about abortion, it was often a white woman talking head versus a white man talking head arguing about it. And it didn't feel like my experience. So I started doing abortion storytelling work um, over 10 years ago now. And um, it really brought me this this opportunity to connect to other people who've had abortions and that that just exploded something in me and took so much weight off of me and felt so beautiful but it still also there was a piece of it that felt incomplete because I'd be reading these books on the history of abortion or people would talk about the past you know pre-row and it was always just like what white women were doing and like you know, I know we all we all know Margaret Sanger exists and what she's been doing. We all probably a lot of people, if you care about abortion, you probably heard about Madame Restell. But I was like, where are the folks of color who did that work too? It couldn't have just been the two of them and a million abortions a year. I think there's no way, right? And so what you know we really wanted to think about is how do we build a story both of what abortion looked like then and also what does it look like now for folks of color and how to rewrite ourselves back into the story and one of the things that I just always thought was so beautiful is being able to retell stories that you know I, I came into the movement like hearing like the story of Jane the folks who were providing abortions pre-row hearing that story and I'm so amazed at the work that they did and then also in our book, being able to retell that story from the perspective of two Black women who were part of Jane, one of whom has never been public about her abortion story before. And so I think being able to tell the true story of abortion has been just an honor and a privilege. And I think what's most exciting about our book is that, you know, I'm sure a lot of you think you, you know a lot about abortion and you probably do. But also, you've only been told half the story if you don't hear the piece about what folks of color have been doing for centuries and are doing now to liberate abortion over in, into whatever we step into next. I love this. I love this, uh, the, the courage and inventiveness and determination you guys have brought 
to filling in these gaps and to uh, providing the resources and the storytelling that would have been really useful, like Regina, when you were feeling what you described as loneliness, right? As is um, a specific kind of what this philosopher Jill Stoffer calls ethical loneliness about when you do not see your own uh, experiences recounted in you know, ethical understandings and historical understandings of an issue. Um, so let's get a little deeper into what our abortion rights discourses have been missing. What is this history and this like vast, uh, like unspoken array of experiences that a lot of our received wisdom about this issue like doesn't account for? Yeah, I want to talk about abortion stigma and uh, media portrayals because you talked about um, the you know and echoing my sharing about look feeling lonely, but also. Um, the stories that we see don't, as Renee was saying, like don't always reflect our experiences. And that has so much to do with not just the legislation and things like that, but also like news media. And so as someone who's on the journalism side, like I want to just bring in my folks and like just to have a moment of reflection about what we've been doing, because it's been happening for a really long time. Um, so historically, Newspapers, news reporters have done the work of the anti-abortion movement by sensationalizing the issue of abortion rather than talking about it as healthcare um, and the very real and justified reasons by people of all types, right? <laughs> like everyone has abortions. Um, and uh, as Renee likes to say, like if you haven't had one yet, you might still. So like, don't discount your, like we all have them and all of our stories are important. Um, so these newspapers and reporters of the time before and after row understood that these sensationalized stories would sell more papers. And so they published these crude headlines about women's deaths and arrests, perpetuating so much stigma about the issue that we all continue to feel today. And I just want to take a moment to say like capitalism is the through line for all of this. And we talk a lot about it in our book, but you know, these newspapers who are printing stigma because new cells, but then there's also like the healthcare systems that are failing to properly treat people because there's this lack of financial incentive and, and it's really awful. But just to get back on track with the news media, so we're still seeing this motive to report stories that would shock people when the reality is so many abortion stories are actually mundane. Like if we told the stories of the majority of people who have abortion, we'd be putting people to sleep. Um, and so instead of telling the stories, we're looking for these like break, breakthrough stories. But when we take a step back and look at how we actually shape people's perceptions of abortion, it means that we might actually be presenting like fallacies. So for example, Leslie Reagan talks about in her book, When Abortion Was a Crime, how a lot of the stories in the early 1900s were of unwed women having abortions. But in fact, like the majority of people at that time who were having abortions were people who were married. But people would think like, oh, well, you know, only one on one like you know so creating these characters of people who having having abortion so it makes it easier to then say well unwed women shouldn't be able to have abortions or unwed women don't deserve access to contraception like all of these things are connected so i just want to say all of that to say like we as journalists also really have to think critically about the coverage that we do even time taking time to step back and think about the stories we're telling and the narratives we're feeding into that don't represent the majority of the people having abortions. I mean, I was just like, like shocked at the way that these stories that we're reading in the book that we included in the book, um, the, the news media and the way that they have continued to cover, have covered abortion and how we've continued to do that. And so I just wanted to call attention to it because I do think it's a really important part of our history that can get missed when we're talking about the perceptions of abortion and who has abortion. I think um, one thing that's really critical in this moment um, in particular, but also throughout the entire history of abortion is this through line of anti-Blackness and criminalization. And I think a lot of people don't see it um, because anti-Blackness is the air that we breathe. Um, we live in a very carceral system, which means that we live in a society in which we think about the solution to someone doing something that we may not agree with or we don't like is to put them in jail. And so instead of maybe figuring out why does why is someone sleeping on a park bench or why is someone stealing this bread, it, we just throw them in jail for doing those things instead of saying, 
something. Oh, maybe it's they have nowhere else to sleep. Let's get them a house. Oh, maybe they don't have the money for this bread. That's why they're stealing it. Oh, let's get them some food, right? And we're doing the same thing when it comes to pregnancy. We are saying if somebody is self-managing an abortion or um, they you know, are using drugs or something during their pregnancy, right? Instead of saying, hey, let's figure out what's going on. Oh, maybe they weren't able to get the abortion that they needed at that time. We're throwing them in jail. That is something that is coming back from the pre-row days, but in a way that we've never seen before. Because prior to, they would sort of arrest the providers or, you know, they'd make them pay a fine, slap on the wrist, you know, things like that. Now they're actually jailing the people who have abortion. And that's disproportionately impacting people of color, in particular, Black people whose lives are simply policed because they do not, by nature of who they are, adhere to whiteness and white society and whatever those things are, right? And we knew that was happening now, but what was interesting to look at throughout history was to look at the way that when you see a rising up of abortion restrictions, at that exact same time, you're seeing it, there's backlash to Black liberation and Black people getting free. So the first abortion restrictions happen in the 18, or some of the first ones that they start enforcing in the 1860s. If anyone forget, remembers what was happening in the 1860s, well, that was the end of slavery. And so then white folks were afraid of the reach and the power that Black people were about to have now that they were newly freed, they had to be paid for their work. Um, and they some of them could start to vote. They were starting to get political power, right? So there's a concern about making sure that white people stay in power. How does that connect to abortion? Well, they start making sure that white women are having babies so they can maintain power, right? It's interesting because it's all about who can maintain power and controlling that through reproduction. At the same time, as we talk about in the book, you see a lot of pushing for eugenics policies and um, complaining about, you know, the size of Black and brown people's families, all of those things, genocide, sterilization, right? All of that is happening at the same time, again, to artificially keep the white population high and in power and control people of color. This ebb and flow continues throughout history. Um, when you also look at when abortion rights um, were legalized nationwide at the Supreme Court. It was in 1973. What had just happened? You had the civil rights movement. You had women trying to work outside of the home, wanting their own credit cards. Whoa, all of these things, right? So it is this, the, the anti-abortion backlash that comes after that is a backlash not only to quote unquote, women's issues, but it's actually about white people, mostly white men, but also some white women being party to this idea to control the, the power and being able to figure out a way, how do we control votes? How do we control our population to make sure that we are able to outpower, outnumber everyone else? Again, you see it now, right? We saw a lot of the abortion restrictions at the exact same time as Obama was elected, Tea Party comes in, they start passing abortion bans and they start restricting voting, particularly for folks of color. Again, it's about controlling power. Um, find me, there's no fascist movement out there that like is also pro-abortion. They hate it, right? Because they know it's about the ability to control people. And what's been interesting and was fun, um, I guess, to read and, and look through history was the way in which to track this ebb and flow and see how abortion was used as backlash to folks getting free and trying to claim their, um, stake their claim in their community in whatever country they were in. I remember, Renee, do you remember when we were at your cousin's house and we had all the sticky post-it notes and we basically like mapped out with different color sticky notes, like 
everything that was happening and then the anti-abortion backlash and everything that was happening and it's really so I I think there's photos of it not that we're including it in the book but yeah Yeah, but it is it's truly it's it's truly an ebb and flow and one of the stories because I do want to share a story um one of the stories that's really stuck out to me um and and really the way that race and class intersect um with these uh, anti-abortion bans is the story of Rosie Jimenez especially because for so long, we've believed certain things about the story and also what the solutions are to addressing what happened with Rosie. But in a lot of ways, the research we've seen, like it actually doesn't go, like our solutions do not go deeper. They really do not get to the heart of what's happening and what happened. Um, so if you're not familiar, um, so you know the story of Rosie Jimenez, um, the person at the center of that story is, of course, Rosie, uh, a 27-year-old woman um, who had a four-year-old daughter at the time of her death. We did an interview. We did interview her daughter for the book, who's now in her 50s, with a seven-year-old daughter. Um, but many people don't know that the abortion that Rosie had after the Hyde Amendment took effect, that then led to her dying from this botched abortion, was actually her third abortion. Um, Rosie already had a young daughter and she knew that she could not support another child like she was determined in that way she knew it and so she you know she had a pregnancy after her daughter was born and then another pregnancy and in both cases she went to her local provider in her community in, in, in South Texas was able to get her abortion covered through Medicaid but then two months after this federal Hyde amendment took effect and this is a budget writer that prevents Medicaid from covering abortions at that time in most cases. Um, And Rosie had her third pregnancy, went to the same provider that she had been going to for other care, not just her abortions, but also for her abortions. Um, And that that doctor was basically just like, I I can't help you because unless you can pay the full price, like I can't help you and just kind of turned her away. And to what Renee was saying earlier, like we never really acknowledged the fact that like it, it should be universally acknowledged that we all deserve health care and people should not be turned away because of how much money they make or what their the color of their skin is. But that has been the case in this country historically. Um, and so we know the Hyde Amendment is part of, as I mentioned, Medicaid. Um, and the rot in this Medicaid system is due to the fact that it was modeled after the welfare program. Um, and Renee talked about this a little bit, but you know, lawmakers were doing everything they could to try to prevent black and brown people from enrolling or to kick them off the rolls if they were enrolled. So for example, if you were a black unwed mother in a household with a man and children, you couldn't, you were ineligible in some states for Medicaid um, because of the way they set up this program where states could dictate, you know, the certain degree to which people could be eligible. And the states with the most people of color in the South often tend to be the ones with the most, you know, restrictions, the most ridiculous restrictions. Um, And so um, politicians all the time, but historically with this Hyde Amendment, were using anti-Blackness in these laws. And so of course Hyde was no different. Um, And we write in the book about how these are entitlement programs um, and the people in them are then painted as undeserving. So again, lawmakers have an excuse, well, you don't make enough money, therefore I can decide to what degree you are actually treated or are forced to die because you think that the, hair, the, the care that you seek, because we don't think you deserve the, the best care. You, you have to go to these other clinics um, that are designed specifically for you and in, in the class that you're in. Um, so we point out in the book, to, get, to make this longer story shorter, but um, we point out in the book how, um, you know, ultimately the, the, the movement has been pushing for a very long time to end the Hyde Amendment through things like the EJ Act, the Federal EJ Act. And while that would be amazing to actually end the Hyde Amendment, it really won't go far enough because as we saw after Roe with the Janes and other activists of the time, radical activists of the time saying that, you know, ultimately people who have abortion should be in control of when they get those abortions and shouldn't have to have a doctor decide that, okay, you can get an abortion or you can't, you know, it's not, it's like the opposite of Oprah. Like you can't get an abortion, you can't get an abortion. It shouldn't be like that. The system shouldn't be set up that way. And so ultimately we really do have to dismantle the healthcare system in this country. If we want to do justice for Rosie, to do justice for her daughter and her family um, and the people in her lives who lost her because of the Hyde Amendment and because of bans like that. Um, And then the other thing that I thought was interesting when we talked to um, Monique, her daughter, she did mention this connection with the sex education in uh, um, in this country. And we did talk a lot about the importance of comprehensive sex education and the importance of people being 
being able to exercise the right to sexual freedom, but just the way that sex education isn't taught, taught in our communities. It's not knowledge that's regularly shared between parents, between children. And of course, that's by design, the people who fought like hell to try to get more comprehensive sex education everywhere, not just in the progressive or liberal states, were always, you know, pushed back or even in the case of the former U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Joycelyn Elders, forced to resign. Um, but sex education also plays a really huge role in, in the way that we talk about reproductive health care and what's accessible and what people know about their bodies. And so just focusing on ending the hide is really only just like a part of this bigger story around Rosie that we haven't really been talking about enough in um, in reproductive rights space, reproductive rights spaces, but also like everywhere, because everyone should really know about these these stories that we tell in our book. Yeah, uh, Regina, I'm hearing um, you know there's so many different facets that contribute to a lack of abortion access and create abortion stigma. And it, it, I always walk away from your work really thinking about the expansiveness of the anti-choice project, right? Like how many uh, different systems they have been able to wield. But, you know, I really love that you guys in your book and in your work focus so much on the role of abortion stigma. And I think those of us who write um, in this space tend to sort of cleave it into, you know, two separate spheres, right? There's policy and then there's stigma and policy is material conditions and policy is laws and policy is stuff that you can measure and stigma is a little harder to identify, right? It's a little more woo-woo. It's a little di more difficult to get people to take seriously. Um, and what I love about your work is how clearly both of you really elucidate how these are actually not separate spheres, right? Policy creates stigma and stigma influences policy. Could you tell us a little bit more about your focus on stigma, how you came to talk about it, the role that it plays in your book? Yeah, I think, um, well, when I do lectures, the way I sort of explain it is that abortion stigma operates on a number of different levels. There's like the institutional. So thinking about maybe a hospital, that it's their policy that they won't provide abortions. Um, there's a legal level which is, you know, we think about the laws, people see those all the time. Um, then there's media, so that can be news or also what you see on television and film. And then um, community level, so individuals, maybe how an abortion provider is treated, how someone in a community is treated, also a religious institution, something like that. And then finally, an individual level, so how we treat one another, but also what we think about ourselves. And so stigma, again, is the air that we breathe. Abortion stigma is defined as the, the idea that abortion is socially and morally unacceptable. And it's then how we show up with anyone that is stigmatized, that is associated with abortion. So we have the individual who has the abortion. They kind of become a little radioactive. We also have abortion providers who are can be radioactive because they are very close to abortion. But then we also have things like the law indicating this is how you treat this person. This is how we're going to treat you within our state. This is, again, as... Um, as Farah Diaz Teo from If One House says when we interviewed them in her book, stigma is how we enact um, criminal or criminalization is how we enact stigma. And so the law is then saying, here's how you treat this person because they had an abortion. Well, you rat them out and get $10,000 for it. We throw them in jail. We throw the providers in jail, right? It's a way of isolating and breaking people up. Um, we get those messages, of course, through the news. When you read a newspaper, how articles frame the story, um, who's right, who's wrong. And we also get it through when you watch TV. I'm sure a lot of you have seen abortion on television and film. I mean, you've probably seen the abortion scandal episode, right? Or Dirty Dancing, that's a lot of people's favorite, right? you learn about a character having an abortion and you get to see how they are treated. We remember that um, baby's dad, he's like, I'm not supportive of this is what she did, right? But I showed up for her. So that we see him overcoming the stigma. So 
this is these are the ways that we teach people how to how to be and how to treat people. In a way, st stigma really works because it makes people not want to share their abortion stories. It makes people not want to help someone when they need an abortion. I'm not, I mean, I obviously want to get rid of abortion stigma, but I also want to remove the stigma. I would like to, what we talk about is like sort of putting the stigma on people who don't help someone else, people who don't show up. Another piece about it that I think we really grapple with to the um, the story that that Regina was telling. So Rosie Jimenez was this, this young mama in Texas who needed an abortion, and but because she was on Medicaid, um, her insurance, once the, the Hyde Amendment, the, the budget rider went through, all of a sudden was not able to use it for her abortion. So she's feeling an enacted stigma because Henry Hyde was like, I don't want any woman to get an abortion, but I can't really stop them. But what I can do is the only vehicle I have is this Medicaid bill, right? So he could then say, any of you who are low income cannot use your health insurance. So then when you can't use your health insurance for something, then you start to feel bad. Like, is this not a good, should I not be doing this? And you already feel stigmatized because you are on a pu on public assistance. So the stigma ends up being compounding. And with her being a Latina, a brown Latina in Texas, the border, like all of the things, she had a child young, all of it compounds, right? But when we tell the story of Rosie as a movement, because she's become this icon, you know, Rosie Jimenez, she died, she's the first woman who died of the Hyde Amendment. You know, we need to overturn Hyde. We need to make sure everyone can use their insurance to pay for abortion. All of those things are really important. But in all the iterations of the story that I'd heard, as Regina mentioned, they never talked about the fact that she'd had abortions before. She'd had several abortions before. And so I don't know the reason why they stopped telling that story because it's in a book, <laughs> I have it over here. Um, it's It was open information, right? But what's interesting is that I think it's because we actually, the sometimes for those of us who are pro-choice or in the reproductive rights and justice movement, we can actually stigmatize one another. And so we stigmatize people who need multiple abortions. So we can think that, well, if we only talk about the one abortion Rosie had, we can make her seem like a good enough victim because people might not feel bad for somebody who's having their third or fourth abortion. We can tell everyone that she died with her um, uh, college tuition check in her hand because she wanted to better herself because we're actually leaning into stigma and respectability politics. So what I think is really, what has been really interesting in, in telling these fuller parts of the story, of these stories, even if it's stories that we've already heard before, we can actually have a conversation about not just how stigma is enacted by the people who are our opposition, but actually how we also lean into abortion stigma to tell a story that is mostly true. What would it look like if we actually told the whole truth? Because the, that, that would actually be real because the half of people who have abortions have more than one. Most people who have abortions have children. Most people who have abortions are on some sort of Medicaid or experience financial logistical barriers to abortion. Those are all the things that Rosie went to or went through, but we'd actually have to look in ourselves and recognize that we also inhabit a lot of that stigma ourselves and we have to do the work to get rid of it because we'll never be able to liberate abortion so long as we're still harboring it. I will say one of the most successful stigma campaigns I think would probably be later abortion because of the way that the, the Roe v. Wade decision instituted this mutual understanding across the country that 
earlier abort like they're the good abortions which are early in the tri you know early in the pregnancy but later abortions oh no don't have later abortions even though religions are as we talk about in the book like there's there's a lot of opinions about about the different uh times when people have abortions and when it's religiously okay versus when it's not for different reasons um but later the stigma that later abortion has caused has been so successful it's actually contributed to this um huge problem we have now which is that there are very few clinics that offer later ab abortion care and we're seeing more and more people need later abortions and have to travel even farther outside of their community for care because there are fewer abortions that provide it because there are so many you know students who or or providers who have to stay away from it whether legally like financially or wh whatever reason again rooted in you know capitalism the undercurrent of all of it but um, but because of the way that we've stigmatized later abortion care, we are seeing people who need abortions in like experience like long term or permanent fertility issue challenges because they couldn't get that abortion when they needed it. And, and then the pregnancy affected them in different ways. So the way that this stigma, you know, which is based on the anti abortion movements like wholly made up campaign against abortions against quote you know partial abortions things like that like it's turned into a healthcare crisis for us as a nation because there's no investment in actually teaching doctors how to treat their patients and that's a problem like a real problem and we also published a piece at the nation not that long ago about um the way that providers in different states the abortion ban states but all across the country are providing c-sections in lieu of abortions because they don't have the training or they're worried that they're going to be sued and that the providers that were interviewed in that story you know said this has been happening before you know jobs and it's happening now more and more and it's happening across the country that's a problem because as someone who's had two c-section like that recovery is no joke and like on a lot of different levels like mental physical all those things and like People are being for, you know, instead of getting what could have been a much less invasive abortion procedure are now undergoing these very, like, you know, so I think that when we talk about stigma, it's also really important to talk about the actual real impact. I mean, of course, they're real, like the, the, the real impacts are on different levels, um, but, but specifically like the way that it's infringed on our ability to get the care that we deserve and our bodies to be treated as like the the sacred things that they, vessels that they are. Um, and then there's just like, because of misogyny and so many other things, like there's just lack of care that we're not being given the procedures that were created to actually make our lives easier. And instead are getting these more harmful invasive procedures um, that could lead to blood clots and things that actually increase your chance of dying. And it's, it's it, you know, not to make it, um, you know scarier than it is but it is true like these things are real and it's it's all by design and rooted in the you know wholly made up as I said wholly made up campaigns that these anti-abortion folks have devised and been strategic about and in a lot of ways have succeeded on and we you know have to really evaluate our thoughts and inter and I hope that's a, a lot of what comes from the book is inviting people to interrogate any beliefs that you might because I've had that experience too in just doing the research and things like that or you know um in the editing work and things that and writing I've done but like really just like interrogating like oh wait why do I feel this way where is this coming from because at the end of the day we're talking about people being able to make decisions about their own bodies um and they should be able to do that and they should be able to get the care that they deserve Regina, you did such a great idea of a uh, great job of just distilling the stakes there. Thank you so much. Um, so you guys are really great and and so thorough and uh, perceptive in your diagnosis. But in the time we have left, and we are going to um, move on to a Q&A pretty soon. So for our distinguished beloved guests, if you want to bring in your questions, type them in the Q&A box so we can answer them. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted uh, to have you guys lay out your utopian vision for us. What is the <laughs> a liberated abortion future that we should be striving for? What does it look like? How do we get there? What are the principles that will guide us there? There's, I think maybe nobody I'd like to hear from this more than the two of you. Yeah. Um, 
I, you know, it's, it sounds, it can feel kind of funny to think about uh, an abortion utopia or what does liberating abortion even look like when like things are so dire and stressful right now, but um, and, and, and I know there are a lot of calls out there to restore Roe and well, let's just get back to, you know, how it was before everything was broken. But if like in reading our book, my hope is that you read throughout history and realize that like, it was always broken guys. <laughs> like if we restore Roe, that just means that we're just shifting who gets harmed. So when they're like, oh my gosh, people have to travel for abortions now. People always had to travel for abortions. People who um, needed later procedures, people who lived in rural areas. Uh, so many people have always had to travel for abortions. And what if that wasn't the case? Like think really big. When you have I, I mean, I don't know. You, you're probably not anticipating that you're going to have a headache. I'm I'm really sick right now. I'm like sweating and I have a sore throat, right? I didn't plan to have this cold. But it, I went downstairs right before this and I got a thing of Theraflu. And I just made it because, you know, I always have it ready just in case I might get sick. I didn't plan on getting sick. I didn't know I was going to get sick today. Honestly, you know, it just pops up randomly. It happens. What would it look like? We do this often for every other sort of health need. Why do we make people wait to get the care they need for an abortion when we could actually have it before you even need it, right? What would it look like to have abortion pills available at the grocery store and the pharmacy or you know, you could order them in the mail or, you know, just next to the condoms at the, the corner store or the gas station, right? Like you could have all of those things and not just abortion pills, but like plan B or any sort of reproductive care that you need. What if you could have it before you even need it? So then you don't have to have this scramble. You don't have to freak out. You don't have to stress. What would it look like to take the struggle and the stress out of abortion care and health care and pregnancy care overall? We force people to struggle so hard. They don't have to. What would it look like if everyone had every single thing that they could possibly need for their pregnancy decisions and for the outcome? And we believe that if we center abortion in this, because of the way that stigma works, if we can unlock making sure that everyone who needs an abortion is able to get all of the things that they need, it's like the, the center of flower and it would bloom to everyone else. So if all later abortion patients had the care that they need, that's going to impact maternal health care for everyone pregnancy care for everyone. If, if young people have the information that they need, that's then going to change the way that information is distributed to all of us. If it's available in every language that people need, it's going to be there, right? How do we just normalize it to the point that we don't stigmatize me for having a cold? <laughs> we don't be like, well, what did you do to get the cold? Truth is, I don't know. I've been in my house for three days. <laughs> Who knows, right? We just give me what I need to get better. And I get to make that decision because I decided I would like to take some Theraflu. I should probably go take some Dayquil. I maybe at, at some point I'll need to go see a doctor. Who knows? If it goes further than this, right? But I get to decide because I know what's best for my body. And if I have questions, I can go get the information. We, we can't continue to have this one size fits all healthcare system that is built on profit and forcing people to make decisions that they don't want to, and also forcing people to recover as quickly as they can instead of actually caring about their health. And so I think for us, 
it's borrowing the on or building on reproductive justice, which it's this beautiful, amazing framework that is turning 30 next month or ne yeah, next month, they'll be 30 years old. Um, but it's this idea that making sure everyone has the right and the resources to be able to decide if, when, and how to grow their families and to be able to do so free from state sanctioned violence and coercion, that they have bodily autonomy and they live and breathe and exist in safe and healthy communities. And so all of that, it is a world vision. It starts out with what I was talking about abortion, but then you can take it to, okay, how do we treat pregnant people everywhere? What does pollution have to do with pregnancy? Well, if people are living in communities where they can't breathe the air, that's gonna mean that they have, they're sick and unhealthy while they're pregnant, their babies will be too. They may have higher rates of miscarriages, all of these things, which we know from conversations about environmental injustice are all connected by race and class, all of those things, right? So for us, this idea of liberating abortion means that if we can start with something that is the most stigmatized and look at how we show up for people who need abortions, we can then bloom into how do we show up for other people um, all across the country and all around the world as they are building their families or not. I don't know how to respond to that except, you know, amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what a wonderful vision. I think it's time to move on. To our Q&A, we've got two really wonderful questions. Um, the first is from Stanford's own Laura Good. Hi, Laura, who asks, co-authoring this book as a team of two Black women seems like such a powerful solidarity-based choice for this topic. How did you approach the creative process as a duo? What was most fun about it? How did collaboration enhance your vision? Oh my goodness, I love this question. I wish I had a good answer. Um, hmm. We, so Renee and I are coming off of like a very long weekend of editing and copy editing our book and stuff like that. So I don't, Renee, do you have a good, I have to think a little bit more if you have a good one. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, at risk of like doing our own <laughs> horn, this is the first book about abortion centering people who've had abortions full stop. And then you add that it's written by two people who've had abortions. And then you add that it's written by two people of color, two black women who've had abortions. Like it's it's not been done before, which sounds kind of ridiculous, like what? But that's the reality, right? Of how much our stories are not necessarily part of this conversation. And I think, Having a partner, someone who's been through it, really getting that, that is huge. The editor who bought the book, it's a black woman who had an abortion. Um, the artist who did our cover, it's a black woman who had an abortion. Um, our agent, black woman who worked in an abortion clinic. I think there's something about the way in which this is this book, this vision, the story, is something that we all have not seen before and needed and that we we work we're trying to work together to like build this for other black and brown folks who have these experiences too and and there's so many of the folks that we interviewed um who also like never really saw their stories mm -hmm. as part of the larger conversation and so being able to create space for them to just like talk about it has been huge. Um, I think what is really, so like, you know, Regina has a journalist background. Um, I have an, a background as an, as an organizer and, um, and comms messaging brain. And so there's a lot of thinking about how this issue is talked about in the news and policy. And, and I work with the people who've had abortions through my organization, we testify. And so we can sort of all pick out the different ways in which this is and is not talked about. And so being able to do that is feels really huge. 
one of the first editors that we met with, she was a white woman. Um, she told us that this book wouldn't sell um, because she said it was too much. It was trying to do too much. It was too big. People wouldn't really get it. Um, you know, how is it different than the other abortion books out there? Um, and so I think, you know, there was a moment in which we were like, I don't know, should we just give up? But because then we found an agent, it was a black woman who got it. We found an editor, a black woman who got it. Like, you just, sometimes it just has to be for us, by us, you know? Um, that feels really, really critical. And I will say, like, the first iteration of our, our book proposal, we weren't really... I think our agent told us to like take off the shackles or whatever the phrase was, but basically like to just allow ourselves to write this book for ourselves because so much of the writing that we all do is through this lens that is the establishment lens, which isn't always our lens as black women, isn't always our lens as people of color. Um, and to really taking a moment to say, okay, no, but we can actually write the book that we want to write like the book that we wish that we had had when we were younger because we both in so many ways even though our experiences were different they were also so similar and so um I think it, it, you know starting from like having a conversation about like who you're writing with um I think it can open like you you figure out the right person to work on a project like this with and you figure out how to then like find all the other people that like we were able to just through like the grace of goodness like come together in a way that was really beautiful. And um, yeah, I think it shows through the, the work we did in the interviews. We, I mean, the interviews were fun. Like the, so much of the book, like even though we were talking about difficult things, there were so many people we talked to who had experienced assault. So we like so many of the things, but you don't really get caught up in that because you're really thinking about how do we present the version of abortion that we have all deserved to see our whole lives and being able to focus on that is such a privilege right like we don't all get to do that we don't always get to do that like in a moment of pure chaos as Renee said like we are in this chaotic period um and so we didn't we didn't take that for granted like we really didn't and and I hope that it shows through the, the work we did in the book our next question touches on some similar territory to what you were just addressing Regina Celeste Marcus hi Celeste asks since you were looking for voices that were by definition silenced, how did you go about beginning the research? How did you find sources for people whom history tried to erase? And thank you for your work. Yeah, um, so this is such a good question. A couple different things, right? Because we, um, ironically, we, uh, we were covering the history of abortion and people of color's experiences with it throughout all of abortion. So we started at um, like 4,500 BCE to now. Um, and so couldn't talk to anybody back then. But what we really wanted to do, um, what, we, what we did is read a lot of books and went and found little things here and there. Because there are stuff about folks of color doing this work in the books, but it's so sparse and it's under interrogated, it's under investigated, it's under the stories are under told or untold. Um, so there was like pieces of that and then bringing it all together. Um, then there was stuff like looking at um, people who um, like in history, when we were looking for a number of midwives during criminalization in the 1800s, to see if they had been prosecuted. Um, just a good old newspapers.com website because the thing about race is that if a black person or person of color is being prosecuted for something the newspapers definitely included their race so what we were able to do was just start searching keywords of like you know negro midwife or something like that plus botched procedure botched abortion um read a lot of different history books things like that and then as far as like for example talking to the two um black women of jane one of them had was in um, the documentary, the HBO documentary, The Janes, which if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. You can see Marie, she's in there. Um, but also I think there are a lot of folks who want their story told. They're just looking for the right person to tell, or you just have to know who to ask. And so, um, 
you know, asking older folks, have you had an abortion or what, and what was that like? Or for the Janes, um, you know, we talked to the producers and they connected us to Marie. And then we talked to um, the Laura Kaplan who wrote the original book. And, you know, I asked her, I saw that there are two black women in it. Do you know the other one? And she said, I do. And so, you know, as I interviewed Laura, we had lunch and once passed the test, she passed us on to that woman and then had a conversation with her. Do we pass the test? Okay, great. She's willing to talk to us and we can tell her story. And um, so I think it's a lot of it is, is that um, people just show up differently when they know that the person telling the story looks like them or has been through something that they've been through. I'll add, you know, we talked to all of the Congress uh, women of color who've had abortions. And similarly, as we were talking to them, what they shared with us is stuff that hasn't necessarily been shared in other ways because people didn't ask them, like, did you have more than one abortion? Oh, yes, actually, I had another abortion at this, time, but people only know about the one abortion. And so being more familiar with the way that these, in these issues intersect for us as people of color allowed us to really like crack open the space to really unpack these things in a way that's different for others. The other thing I wanted to say, I want to just give a shout out to Renee and the work that she does with We Testify, because We Testify as an organization is a leadership pipeline for people of color who've had abortions and other people who've had abortions. And without that, I mean, no one else is doing that work. No one else is not just like talking, coaching people in terms of like how to share that, but like talking them through like, okay, what part of your story do you feel comfortable sharing? You can change what part of you start, you know, like, and making sure that they're okay with that. And so, of course, because Renee was already tapped into this work and doing this work, we were able to also talk to a lot of the folks that I only know because of Renee and really do those interviews and, and share those stories as well in the story and respect people who were sharing their stories and telling the, the details of the story that they feel comfortable with. So a lot of this is just building off of the work that Renee had already been doing um, and that in, in terms of abortion storytelling that has not been done elsewhere. And so I do, like I said, I want to give credit to Renee because a lot of these stories wouldn't have been told if not for the incredible work that she has done in creating, we testify in creating that space um, for, for storytellers of color to come together. And the work continues. I think that's all we have time for, but I really want to thank both of you so, so much for sharing your time and your expertise and your perspective with us. I learned a lot. I am really thrilled that we got to have you here. Uh, the book is Liberating Abortion. It's out in October, right? And uh, everybody should buy it. <laughs> October 1st, but pre-orders now. <laughs> pre-orders now. All right, go pre-order. And thank you so much to Renee and Regina and to all our guests for joining us. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.